I feel, you know, uh, in a sense that I have been on this mythical road, on the idea that the road leads to the rest of the world, was something that kind of fascinated me. And, you know, becoming a filmmaker um, allows you to follow that road, literally, and being out there and feeling part of that. Over the years, a lot of my work as a filmmaker and currently now looking back over the music as well has all come from the US. And you know, that was all planted way back in the mid 50s with uh, the, the old black and white cowboy films, if you like, the children's television as they called it back then with The Lone Ranger and Tonto and Hopalong Cassidy and uh, Range Rider and all those things. I mean, I even the like of my music, like I've delved into that for a particular song as well, you know. Um, so I'm kind of acutely aware of the of the um, mileposts, if you like. That uh, you, I mean, everyone will have this in their lives. Uh, and it is quite interesting to try and find those mm -hmm. this would be like you know if you were just sitting here which I am of course Calma never lies sitting here playing by myself reminding me of my childhood you could do that. Anyway, it's a song about growing up here in Hollywood, or specifically up at Marino, what I used to call Marino Canyon. And, oh, Hopalong Cassidy was my hero on black and white TV, recorded by my dad on an old brownie. And this song is about the picture that my dad took of me all those years ago. In the, 1950s. Deep in the hills of Hollywood, I hear the ring of spurs. I see Marino Canyon and my heart begins to stir. Old Hoppy was my hero, Topper was his horse. Never once did I think that life could run its course. Well, I was lucky seven. In March of 53, when Daddy took that old time picture of me. Staring down the barrel of a six gun on my hip. Don't rile me, don't style me, don't give me no lip. Singing tie, yippee, 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 yay. How I yearn for the days that never went away. Hop along in Cisco and the Range Rider too. And the crimson campfire crackling in that midnight blue. Mm. Well, I was that prairie hero, real cool cat. Black satin shirt and hat, bandana boats and chaps. Old Mobile was my tin horse, my Palomino pal. Mama was my sweetheart, my one and only gal. And there wasn't any YouTube or cyberspace to play. Just two channel TV, we rode the cathode ray. 
truth and day for night and black and white across that Milky Way. On the silver moon sun bright on those sagebrush nights. Singing ti yippee yeah How I yearn for the days that never went away. Hop along in Cisco and the Lone Ranger too. Crimson campfire crackling in that midnight blue. All right, where's my fiddle player? Six dollars twenty-eight per bushel. Sixty-six out of Oklahoma City. El Reno and Clinton going west on sixty-six. Hydro, Elk City and Texola, and there's an end to Oklahoma. Thirty-two cotton in southwestern Oklahoma. Average sixty and three-quarter cents per pound. His name, a symbol of terror, the deadliest killers in the West. Now they were all together, gangs and guns ready to take over Carson City on the eve of the world-famous Corbett Fitzsimmons championship fight while a beautiful woman played for the biggest stakes of all. Coming back to the States, and particularly coming back to Highway 66, which I first went down basically 30 years ago. No, nowhere you go back to is quite as you imagined it. I think that's pretty true to, with most things. Um, particularly if there's like 30 years between the two visits. First of all, is it going to be there at all? And as it, this is, where is it exactly in this spot? Oh yes, there it is. Um, but I was thinking, yes, okay, there it is. And it's, you know, there's no place Texo like Texola is still on the sign there. The, the beer has been, um, um, rusted off the, the um, neon sign outside. But it was most of all, like, f mostly for me, being there and, 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 okay, remembering the road, remembering this, remembering that. But in a sense, it was all the other things that have happened in my life since I, last, I saw that, and now I'm looking at it again. 30 years later, it was like, what the fuck is going on here? It's like, come for a full circle, but all this stuff, and I haven't been back here for all that time, yet no place tex like Texola has never, ever left me as, a, as a, a, a saying or a phrase. And sometimes it's, quite, it's quite a sad feeling for me. Um, Maybe I'm as an old as, and decrepit as the buildings that I photograph, but it's, it's, it's much more a, a thing of, of, of time passing. Where is the black B-52 circling overhead? It's incredible uh, to be walking the soil and heading west and all those things for sure. Um, but I think uh, you do get into a fairly rarefied state of mind when you're on the road and the, the longer you're on the road, the more rarefied you become, I think. Or maybe you just find your groove. Um, but, you know, I... 
Looking back on the first times, it was yes. I mean, it was all pretty much of a, a, a brand new, strange, but also oh familiar. Even though I'd never been there before, I mean, it's like that old uh, feeling, you know, uh, feeling lonesome for a place you've never been. Idea, um, you know, soldaje, as it's as as as, the, as it's described. Um, and that, I mean, that haunts me to to this day. That that feeling. I mean, this is why we've all the all the films subsequently have really been been or imagined to be. You know, uh, in this new world, which it really was. But I, like I say, it was so familiar because you're, uh, you know, um, you feel as if you're driving through. Uh, uh, a, a film, but it's also it's is the reality you're in, and you're carrying the backlog of imagery with you, and the movies that you've seen, it, it paints the landscape for you, and you know being all uh, in that kind of rarefied state of, of c cerebrally travelling the road, and then finally being on it. Um, and seeing, like you can go out and touch the road signs, um, or the, the, the neon, you hear the neon buzzing. What is it about this country that has, or this idea of this country that has inspired me to, to want to fill a minute Think about it, write songs about it, make films about it, people in it, etc., etc. If I had to title the message I'm sharing, I would title it The Danger, the Horror of Unbelief. The danger of believing a bad report and delivering a bad report rather than saying what God says and agreeing with it. And my friend, if you think there's a shortcut to victory, if you think there's a shortcut to healing, if you think there's a shortcut to salvation other than coming to the Word of God, you've been deceived by the devil. There's only one way to be saved, and that's through Jesus Christ, and He is the Word. There's only one way to be delivered from all your distresses, and that's through the Word of God. There's Every film that I've tried to make, uh, it's like you're saying something about yourself. Because to me, you know, you can't do a film, at least I certainly can't do a film that is of my creation that isn't some kind of exploration of, of, of who I am. Um, whether it's... Whether it's, it's, it's exploring the soul of a born-again preacher and hungering for some kind of salvation as was in Power in the Blood with Vernon Oxford. A preacher's job, according to the Bible, <laughs> is to teach the body to function in the gifts of the Holy Spirit so that they may go out throughout the world and fulfill the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus told them, the disciples, that includes me and you, if you're a born-again Christian, I don't care 
What denom... Let's forget the denomination. Just take them and throw them away. They're not in here anyhow. But you are supposed to be a Christian, and that means like Christ. That don't mean uh, Protestant or Catholic, Baptist, anything. It means Christian. And unless you are <laughs> Christian, you're going to go to hell. The Bible says that every tongue will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. You can either do it now because you want to, or you can wait till Judgment Day and do it because you've had to. But you're going to do it. There ain't no ifs, ands, and buts about it because this book said you would. And if God said it, that settles it, whether you and I believe it or not. Whether it's exploring the soul of the singer-songwriters in Nashville, Tennessee, about their songs and realizing, my God, I'm living the life that they're writing about. Let's go and see how, how these people are and try and make some sense. Again, that's about who you are yourself. Put your heart in the line. When you lay your heart on the line, you're betting on something, right? Sure. Yes, yeah, like laying your life on the line. So you're gambling. You're gambling, right. Now lost in the wine, now to his mind. Last verse? Yeah. yeah. Okay, give me the first half course of the verse again. There was a day he thought there he could be There was a day he thought he could be somebody they'd say. Really gets to me the way that he plays. Right from the heart. Ah. There was a day he thought he could be somebody that said Really gets to me the way that he writes Right from the heart That's it, man. Mm -hmm. Yep, most of the emotions I want to write about I've already tasted So I don't really have to really relive them I mean, I'm saying that you don't have to do this over and over again. But you damn sure got to be lonely one time, got to cheat one time, be cheated on one time. You got to, you got to do all these things to write about them honestly. Cowboys, they don't ever understand this thing. Till they find that one they always lose. That's what want to help you write love songs if you don't have adventures. Damn it, I only write love songs. I've got to feel love and win, lose, and draw. And uh, I've got to be lied to. I've got to tell a few lies. You know, all those things. Talk some trash and have some fun and put these into songs because everybody does this. And I do it. But I can write about it. The cowboy takes his lonely pen in hand. The truck drivers on Highway 66. Um, the honky tonks in the bars, the different cultures, the music as we go across. What makes all these people tick? The spirit of the road. I mean, then you go back into, you know, on the road. And then you go back into Ginsburg and, you know, the beats. Um, it's all hidden in there. It's all to do with all that sort of restlessness of, of what's over the horizon, I think. It's, it's an all, like the journey is more important than the destination.
But the actual point for me was my encounter in Belfast in 1966 with D.A. Pennebecker and Bob Dylan on the streets and, and seeing Penny filming Dylan and being transfixed and thinking this is, this is a really cool thing to do. Um, this is as good as rock and roll. This is as good as having a, a guitar on your, around your neck as have a camera on your shoulder. I remember him like been very influential uh, in through the, his work uh, in uh, Don't Look Back with Dylan and Eat the Document, etc. The kind of fluidity of his lens um, and the fact that there was nobody telling you what to think. There was no commentary, which is, um, if you like, one of the main influences I think that um, I've had as a filmmaker. I've always tried not to tell people too much what to think in a direct way. We've decided that we don't like what the, our square boxes living on our little semi-detached houses doing whatever everybody else expects of us. We've decided that we're just not going to conform with what everyone has told us to do. We're going to be different and because we're going to be different we're wrong, thus the name Punk Rock. Is that the bar of in Belfast? The pile's old, that's a pity. Okay, so there's a track to bang up, and then you walk back to the city. We ain't got nothing, but they totally care. Don't even know, you know, they just want money. We can take it or leave it while we need. Is that the time of us? I was wanting desperately to, uh, to be whatever that creature was that I had imagined myself to be at the time. Uh, there's no doubt about it, like the, the archetype, the image is, is the Pennybaker independent filmmaker, I mean, uh, that, that was, the, that was the, the carrot in a way, looking back on it. But just to be that person. Uh, so the idea, uh, I mean, I sort of felt looking back on Shell Shock Rocket, you know, I had those ingredients, but I was in the right place at the right time. And here was, a, here was this wonderful thing. This, the only chink of light that was coming from the darkest streets of Belfast on the blackest night was kids coming together and, and making their, their music and uh, writing about it. I loved the fact that the, the shell shock rock was going through the bath in the BBC along with, you know, the bombs and the bullets and the, the reports about the violence. And here was this other thing, you know, the spirituality of that saying, no, fuck you, you know, this is actually more important. The reason it has survived is that for me, looking back on it, it was not a film about punk rock. It was punk rock. And I think that's the key to it. I'm tired of the monster. Go and get it now.
Guess I'm just an old timer now But I still got that old know-how Or I'll tip my hat and I'll get the door Got a pretty little angel that I look out for And when it boils right back down to it I'm as rough as that old bud saw Right down to the raw And I feel like the last western cowboy Riding on the last prairie moonrise Heading for the last spring ride Just been born again Was I riding back in 1810 Did I see Lakota buffalo run Did I hear eagle bone whistling Did I drive the golden spike into the heart of the Utah night It's hard to see And I feel like the last western cowboy Riding on the last prairie moon ride Heading for the last spring round up Waiting for the Waiting by the age of starlight to end. I do have a sense that I I could have could have been, you know, riding back in eighteen and ten as as the song Last Western Cowboy sends to suggest uh, some part in my soul did witness Buffalo Run or driving the golden spike, connecting the, you know, which is really the, the demise of, of the First Nation. Um, there, there's some things you just can't really put a finger on, you can only feel it. Um, and for me, it is very strong and, and when you start thinking about it and you start trying to write about it and make some kind of sense about it um, in order to just find out who you are, where you are after all these years and what you've done, what you've achieved, if anything there is a, a sense of belonging to another time, another place and that place for me is way out west. <laughs> ago, Hank and I first got acquainted. He had a wonderful song called Kalaija, about a wooden Indian. So it's famous to every wooden Indian that I see, I call him Kalaija. Kalaija is roasting hot and I'm telling you something, if you do this, if you do what I'm about to do now, Elijah. 
And I want you to bring your camera in here real close to Kalaja. You will feel spirit of a wonderful people. Wonderful people that were driven out of this, this land that we're in. The land was stolen from you guys. And now there's effigies of you outside tourist motels all over this land. So, Elijah, I mean what I say. For half a century, Route 66 was America's main street, the way west, before interstate highways fenced folks off from homemade America. Fabled in novel song and television series, Route 66 was the road to our American dream, the symbol of freedom. From now on, you can drive from Chicago to Los Angeles without a stoplight. This is WGN Chicago. It symbolized the American dream and they're going to California for the California gold or whatever, the better life, etc. which is really what the American dream is striving for in terms of all that, um, even though it's a Madison Avenue invention. At that time, uh, in a sense, um, uh, visually, America still looked a lot like the imaginary America which you'd seen on the celluloid. The big cars, the most obvious example of it. Uh, when I was making the film, I had a 1967 uh, Chevy Impala, ragtop, red. It was wonderful. And a big, you know, Detroit muscle under the hood. I mean, it was wonderful. Going to where Woody Guthrie had grown up, going to his little town, Okima, finding out that he wasn't liked in Okima because of his politics, all that sort of thing. And here's this great American folk hero. And the, the only memorial to him, if you like, in, in his hometown at that time was his name printed on the wooden water tower. I mean, this is like... And then going to where the house was, apparently, so by someone who knew where it was Lifting a piece of wood from the ground, which supposedly was a piece of Woody's house, just a little piece of wood. Uh, known as Guthrie Wood. And now I kept that piece of wood for all those years until I'd made took it on the rail when I was making hobo as to carry the spirit of Woody Guthrie with me in a piece of wood, carry his, but also like the nature of a good luck charm or whatever, keep us safe on the rail, this piece of wood that had been part of his house. I still have it. I mean, it got broken too and I glued it together again. And one night in the Hobo jungle, I couldn't, couldn't find the piece of wood which had buried in my bedroll. And I thought one of the hobos had found it and lit the fire with it. And I said, oh, fuck, they haven't burnt the spirit of America, you know, Jesus. 66 was still a narrow 
Tulane Highway. Harry Truman was the man who ran the show. The bad Korean War was just beginning. And I was just three years too young to go. Country music hadn't gone to New York City yet. And the service man was proud of what he'd done. And Hank and Lefty crowded every Jew. I think with every film that you do, there are certain people that stand out or for some reason stay with you and become part of the fabric of your existence. I mean, I can think of it with all the films practically that are to do with anything from here. But eventually, like, some of them fall away, but others last the you know, the, the test of time. Jimmy Mack, the old boy that I met somewhere in some parking lot in, I think it was Springfield, Missouri. You know, and he fitted the, the stereotype. So we've got, we've got to talk to this guy. And it was, he, he had had such an incredible story and such a, a face. Well, we had one party. It, uh, you ain't, it, you can't ever have another one like it. <laughs> I mean, about three, four days later, I woke up or I sobered up a gas. I mean, it was beer cases all over the place. It was whiskey bottles, and I, I got up and I fooled around and found my keys to my car, and I said, "Man, I'm leaving. I gotta go." Started to go out and get in the car, and she come with me. I said, I said, no, I said, I said, I said, there's no more party. I said, I'm going home. She said, not without me, ain't. I said, oh yes, I am. And she says, no, you ain't. And she pulled out a piece of paper, and it was a marriage license. She says, where you go home, I go home. <laughs> I didn't even know I was married. <laughs> the other one that immediately comes to mind is, is Bobby Job. In, in Amarillo, um, being totally enchanted by his music and his voice and the place that he played, the Cattleman's Club, I now call it the Cattleman's Bar. One day, completely out of the blue, about maybe four, five, six years ago, a letter from Bobby Job telling me what had happened to him since those days and He'd lost, he'd been very sick. He'd had stroke and lost his voice and was fighting back and had now got his voice back at, and was doing little dances and stuff with the local band. Um, like some were down in the local VFW or whatever, you know, it was like, uh, and he'd been going through his possessions of which he had very little at this stage through a cardboard box. At the bottom he'd found my ad address on a bar napkin from the Cattleman's Bar in Amarillo, that very first night that we met. And of course he wrote to me. And it started again, I started to write back to and fro, and that's how that song, Last Chance to Dance, came about. Because it really was for Bobby and his, you know, but it's, it's about taking that leap. I want to be a Western song. It's not a feel like a, I want to be a Western song. To give him that song and for him to like it was a wonderful approval for me. Uh, I only wish to God he'd lived long enough to, to hear the, you know, the properly recorded version of the song. streets feeling fair and hot and any heat out there in the chrome barrage spirits dance and come off flies member nights in Amarillo 
Silver spurs and silver bullets Steel guitars and the Lone Star Stars And Bobby played the cattleman bar Catching out for cattle town To shake old Bobby's hand Going back to the armadillo To play a little Lone Star Band Bunch of pickers picking high Punching cords out in the sky Last chance to dance for the sweet by and by A letter came from the blue neon And half a life had come and gone Found your number on an old napkin In that old bar we all drank in It's kind of slow in old timers town The old iced tea Time to breathe in scenery with Western spirits dancing free. Catching out for cattle town, I shake old Bobby's hand. I'm gonna be a Western song in a swinging Lone Star band. Bunch of pickers. Punching chords out in the sky Last chance to dance Or the sweet by and by People that you've met, and the, the ideals, the, the spirituality of those people, the, the hardships that they've had, the spirit of commitment to a particular life, all that kind of rubs off on you. But yet I remain living here in Northern Ireland <laughs> um, with the knowledge that I, at one stage of my life, I had my immigration papers all signed, sealed and delivered to uh, go and emigrate to Canada um, as a ways to getting to the United States because it was easier back in those days, and we're talking about 1973, 74 sort of time to go to Canada and then make your way into the States. And I wonder, you know, what would have happened? You know, maybe you would never have been a filmmaker if you'd done that. Travel alone between Minot and Haver was, it was a pretty good mention because it's uh, basically farmland without many houses. So you really don't have uh, things to divert your, 
your sauce. You see your sauce, so uh, we're back to home. We're back to things that you've done in the past, but we're back to your family life. Then you get kind of a melancholy thing where you just can talk to yourself or you start singing to yourself. But this aloneness brings this uh, kind of thought pattern out that you wouldn't normally get in your day-to-day -day life is too fast, too much involved, and here there's nothing. Outside of saying, you've thought everything you could say, but there all of a sudden there's one more thing that hasn't been thought, and now you got that time to do it, like spending time in jail. Nothing else to think about except just to think. When I was introduced to Bear Grease, I knew instantly that I'd find the subject that I wanted to make the, you know, base the film around. And when I first saw him, you know, he was, oh my God, here comes Lee Van Cleef. He had that look about him. He was a movie star and he had a dangerous look and with the confidence and he was like a contemporary sage, he could talk. And these are all things that are essential, you know, if you're going to make a film about somebody, you know. He had his attitudes, uh, which had come from, you know, from roaming the world. I had never, I think, ever met anybody who knew who they were so much as he did. The confidence of the men, which was a pain in the ass after a while sometimes, you know, he knew everything. He was always right and the son of a bitch was always right. You can't argue with it, you know. But basically, you know, he, uh, he taught me how to survive out doing the film and riding the trains, the tricks of the trade, so to speak. How to, well, you know, what, first of all, what kind of car are you going to ride? What you could ride? How to get onto that car to start with? And sometimes more importantly, how to get off it? Uh, you know, how to make hobo coffee? what kind of food you should have, you should look for, what, where to go to find, uh, uh, you know, um, scraps in a dumpster, uh, what was, you know, you could eat what you couldn't eat, uh, where to go to have a wash, for example, the missions, the food banks, the way to um, approach other hobos, in the sense like, you know, everybody out on the rail is out there for um, a reason, unless you're a foolish filmmaker, you know. Uh, but everybody has a reason out there and everybody is anonymous, so to speak. They're all running from something, whether it's the law or themselves. Uh, so consequently, nobody uses their real name. I was given the, the name, the handle of Irish John. Would you believe? I mean, they could, they're, they're not exactly the most original people in their thoughts, <laughs> but <laughs> they're, they're all genuine, you know. I assume in many of my works, uh, the character, the, uh, the, the, the essence, the spirit of who I am filming. It's like somebody once said, it's like you're, these are your this is your alter ego. Bear Grease in Hobo was my alter ego. Probably the loneliest feeling and the saddest feeling you get is when you haven't ridden for a while and then you start to ride because it takes that two weeks or whatever it is to get adjusted in shape onto the grit 
knowing what you're doing, put enough of the shit, and then you're up with it. But I would say the biggest thing is basically have nothing in your pocket. You know, because you always seem like you're generating something. You go out, you chop wood, you make 20 bucks or so, you always keep that five bucks rattled. It's like going into a bar asking for a job. If you can't go in there and get a cup of coffee first, it puts you in another shot. It goes to show you that that pride is more important than food. That pride is what can kill you. I kind of was bringing to this my own history of, of, of trying to write stuff. And the idea of, of beat poetry, for example, and having the, you know, the background of Ginsburg and Kerouac and all that kind of stuff from, from my, my youth. And then later at the time in New York City, etc. Meeting Ginsburg, you know, it was kind of in there. Uh, and the writings of Dylan, all these people. And here's my chance is for it to be real, to, be, to, to write something that really is on the ball, out there, living it. August 31st, 1990. The cascades are upon us now, keeping the stars company. Black silent fir trees cover the land. The great metallic snake crawls over the hump. Suddenly, we're in the tunnel. Nine miles of mind-bending blackness, the screech of metal on metal. Two cigarettes glow and burn away fast in the wind rush. Psychedelic lights flashing past at 60 miles per hour, split-second intervals of crazed insanity, illuminated Madness blasting through the mountain, diesel fumes washing down slugs of fortified wine. Whoosh. We're out of the tunnel and into the most magical landscape I've seen in years. The cascades by starlight, towering black above and dwarfing the grandeur of this hotshot freightliner. There's a three quarter moon chasing across the craggy peaks, silhouetting fir tree rims like fine lace, and then careering into deep blue starlit sky, occasionally dipping behind a veil of white mist hanging just above the trees. What lives in these dark trees? What dimension of wild, untamed nature Ed and myself are transfixed. There's rivers, waterfalls, rapids, and little towns flashing by. At what speed, I don't know, but it's fast. Winding down and around the mountains, temperature is way down, and we're wrapped in poncho-style army blankets. Spirits are high. A harmonica song is being spontaneously composed. Jimmy crack corn, Jimmy crack corn, I don't care, my master's going away. Fortified wine, fortified wine, makes me feel mighty fine all the time. This song is dedicated to my friend, Bear Grease.
Did you hear that whistle blow? Could be from long ago. Yeah, back, hey, 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 oh. Hey, ride that train and go. Oh, High Line, Hot Shot, Cadillac, coldest car on my telly. From life's cellar side, you're a real hard ride. Blizzards are blowing on the gray tail I wonder what the poor poor's doing tonight. It's 40 below in dawn's blue light. That night train song, well, it's long since gone. The embers are dead, but the wind burns on. Did you hear that whistle blow? Could be from long ago. Yeah, back, hey, 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 hey. Farewell to those Highline ladies who work the iron horse alone. To square wheel hot box rattlers, hey rattling and a prattling at the moon. To jungle fires and the hot yard blues, to Batman, Duffy, and old Spoke Lou. Hey, my nod, Louie and Scott Caraboo. Cardboard letters back home to you. Did you hear that whistle blow? Could be from long ago. still live in this mythical land, which I know is not the reality. There's a place, you know, where you try to maybe find yourself, to let your character develop. I've always said, like, coming to the U.S. is like putting on a very tight-fitting glove that fits me perfectly. I, I'm not considered a freak. If I wear Western boots and buckles and a hat, and to me, I feel as if I was born in a Stetson hat. I mean, it's a curious thing. I fit into this image of myself when I'm here. And I feel at home in that. <laughs> Dance for the 
the sweet by and by So settle up in the Sulu globe Your friend for always Bobby Joe